we are just so happy to be with you today. Uh, we're here to tell you that Oath provides new parents complete support by curating small intimate chat groups integrated with medical experts for each stage of the pediatric journey. Oath places each expecting or new parent into a small group of eight to 12 other parents with similar child age, geographic location, and career goals. They are then guided by an Oath facilitator and a team of local and stage-specific medical experts who empathically surface personalized wisdom to empower the whole family. Throughout the week, Oath provides a proactive, holistic curriculum of content. Wonderful. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Dr. Sarah Mitchell. I'm a chiropractor by training, but I found my passion empowering other parents to teach their little ones to sleep and parent confidently day and night after my own experiences. So I have five minutes today, so I'm going to really drill down to the most important things you really need to know about sleep. So the first thing that you need to know about sleep is that... The drive to sleep is biological. This is really cool. As your body uses ATP, that's our fuel molecule for energy, this protein called adenosine builds up and it signals your brain it's time to sleep. And babies are growing so rapidly, like exponentially, your newborn will double their size by the time they're five months. Think about that for a second. So their little metabolisms are churning and working so hard. They're going through a lot of fuel. That's why they have to eat so frequently. And because of that, they're building up a lot of adenosine, that, a byproduct of that fuel molecule. And that's why they need to nap so much. And you may have heard the term awake time. And if you haven't, you heard it here first, super important. Our awake times are based on this observation. And awake times mean they refer to the time from when your child woke up, either for the day or from a nap, to when they need to be asleep the next time. So how long they can comfortably stay awake for is what an awake time is. And in the newborn period, up to about three months, that time is super short, much shorter than most people realize. I wish I'd known that when I brought my baby home, but basically it's 45 minutes to about an hour and a half by the time you're three months. If you surpass that time, it just gets it, like it becomes harder to get your child to fall asleep and then stay asleep. So you're going to want to learn about awake times. Now, while the drive to sleep is biological, the way we sleep is actually a learned habit, which is kind of mind blowing for a lot of people, especially if you have like a two week old. It is definitely at the forefront of a lot of parents' minds of how often they're touching the medical community and trying to prevent any exposures to COVID-19. So our office has definitely um, done what most medical offices have done, which is basically do extra cleaning, make sure that um, the, the babies are as safe as we can be, bring them into a, uh, most offices, I think are only bringing in babies when there is only well children around. So so when, the, when you are in the hospital, all babies will meet a pediatrician at some point or a nurse practitioner who specializes in babies. And that nurse practitioner will examine the baby for the first time, make sure the baby is healthy and okay to go home with the parents. And then based off of what they see in the nursery, like whether the baby is gaining good weight or not losing too much weight, all babies lose weight in the beginning. But if the baby is not losing too much weight in the beginning or isn't particularly yellow or jaundiced, they might say you can wait a couple days before seeing the pediatrician that you have set up to see versus, oh, if the baby's weight has dropped a little bit more than they would like, or the baby is a little bit more yellow and jaundiced, or there might be questions about breastfeeding or feeding, then they might suggest that you see your pediatrician within the next couple of days. So that pediatrician you see in the hospital will usually designate you should what how many days you should wait. Um, I usually see most of my patients within one to three days of hospital discharge. Okay. And then after that first yeah, um, after that first visit, they get the next kind of rounds of when to come and schedule yeah. it before they even leave. <laughs> yeah. So there yeah. are a lot of visits in the beginning. In pre-COVID times, there were many more visits. Um, and it's because there's a lot more questions in the beginning because questions change basically every day. Today, the baby cried a lot. Today, the baby pooped a lot. And so the questions change daily. And so in the beginning, we might be seeing a parent like every week even or every couple of days if the weight is dropping. And then eventually it spaces out to like one month, two months, four months, 
six months, nine months, and then a year. And then some of the visits now, because of COVID, we are combining um, for some where there may not be a shot. Uh, so the pain. So of course we can work head to toe um, on whatever is going on, whether it's pregnancy related or not. Um, and then we can help with incontinence. And so that would be something where you're leaking maybe with a, like a cough or a sneeze. Um, perhaps it's when you're running or maybe jumping, you, if you have some leaking, um, it can also be like an urgency where you feel like you can't get to the bathroom fast enough. Um, we can help uh, with that as well as if you feel like you're not getting a complete void. So that can be a bowel or bladder and all can be helped with physical therapy, um, working on the, the control, using the muscles to control those. Um, we can help with prolapse, which is um, often described as like a heaviness in the pelvic region or a feeling of kind of falling out in the vagina or pelvis region. Um, region. And um, so as well as diastasis recti, and that is a separation of the abdominal muscles. So along the midline here, and I want to say, first of all, that that's totally normal to have the abdominals kind of separate as the belly grows because it has to do that to make room for the growing fetus. Um, but so, and it often, it just gets better with time afterwards, um, but you can do some directed kind of physical therapy exercise for it as well. I've come with manuals and they're all different and you have a lot to learn and need some real guidance. So I um, strongly feel that, you know, you should pick a pediatrician that you feel comfortable with, where there's a sense of mutual respect, someone who really listens to you and doesn't rush you and um, doesn't make you feel like your questions are silly or stupid. You know, there are no dumb questions. And you want to um, develop a relationship with a pediatrician who will be a true partner in helping you raise a healthy, thriving, and emotionally resilient child. So um, one thing that happens often early in a baby's life in the first uh, few days or weeks is that they don't sleep very well during the day. And um, so what's a mom to do to get a little bit of sleep if she has a baby that has a reversed schedule? If you notice during the third trimester that the baby was very active at night, then chances are when baby is born, he or she is going to be active at night as well. And so this, you know, this does resolve over time, but in those early days, what's a mom to do to get some sleep? So my uh, best advice is to sleep when your baby sleeps. So give yourself permission to nap and to rest and to relax during the day if that's when your baby is conked out. And the other thing would be to, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help or to make a schedule with your partner so that you're doing shift work at night so that each of you is able to get some sleep. And furthermore, that you're taking those, um, you know, naps during the day to catch a, a few snoozes, you know, anytime you can. So that's, um, that's the second question that I chose among the many that I get. And then finally, um, when should I start reading to my baby? So it turns out that talking and reading and singing and interacting with your child is one of the most important things that you can do as a parent and a caretaker. We know that children who hear many, many conversations and words and stories by the time they're three actually do better in school, they thrive more socially, and their long-term academic and social success is determined by nothing more than these words and um, verbal interactions that they have in those first three years. So it's never too early or too soon to start reading to your infant. And you know, you're not going to have energy in the first week or two, and that's totally fine. Um, <laughs> But and you don't have to read children's books initially. You just need to read out loud and talk and have conversations with, you know, your family and your friends and your partner and have your uh, and, and, you know, and have your child present because they're like little sponges and they are going to benefit greatly. from that Yoga is, happens like every moment, like right now when your technology is doing its thing. So let's go ahead and go to that first slide. So what is yoga and do babies do yoga? And the answer is yes, babies do do yoga. So our program at It's Yoga Kids is from babies all the way to teenagers. So we are following this 
brand new life all the way to its full fruition. Um, that includes body, brain, and heart. And that is our purpose. And we do that so that we can create a better positive force in the world. And I think that's what's required right now in our world is being that positive force. So the three elements that I like to think of yoga as are mindfulness, which a lot of people talk about and studied independently, um, movement, um, which of course is what a lot of people think yoga is, a pose on a mat, and then meditation, which is this ability to be still, still in a moment. Um, and those are the three things that kind of add up to yoga at its yoga kids. All right, let's go to the next slide. Maybe. Well, I can dig into the next slide if it's not gonna forward. Is everybody still with me? Oh, good. Got it. Okay, mindfulness. Um, you're gonna find a theme here, but mindfulness really for us comes down to breathing and it comes down to why do we breathe? Everyone talks about that and it's kind of annoying, especially when you're upset and somebody's like, breathe, and you're like, ah, I'm gonna, you know, no. And there's this resistance. And um, the truth is, is that once your fight, flight, stress response goes into its cycle, and, and what we're able to demonstrate to them is really the patterning, that's the learning. And when we do that authentically, which means we make mistakes and we can own that and we can embrace that and share that love and that understanding, I just think that's the, that's the human way of being and that's what the world is calling upon us for right now. So I really find that what affects me most in yoga is my mindset and how I approach everyday problems. So I'm just gonna say that I'm gonna narrate yeah. what what's going on right now and it felt silly at first and that passed so quickly i mean it's just you practice it and suddenly it just becomes second nature to be much more verbal with your child so i think right. that initial like this is kind of embarrassing and then so you know that I'm having passes. a conversation with a person who's not talking back right but when they when that it's all input at that point, right? But then there gets to be this output and it's amazing. And regardless of I mean, it, you also remember like you see how much they understand also before they start to speak that because receptive or what we understand language, it starts to, you know, um, form more early earlier than expressive languages, which is what they what they express, right? Mm -hmm. Through verbs or through gestures that, because they have to understand what, what is happening in order to then use that word. Um, and, and I think speaking of your silly, feeling silly, I think a lot of people have a difficult time with this next one that I suggest, which is sing. Now, I don't mean that you have to sing every day and in every way with your child. You do not have to be musical or consider yourself musical. I simply mean adding a silly element, uh, adding joy into a routine, whether that's you pooped, you pooped, you really, really pooped, right? Or <laughs> dis distracting a child or engaging a child with music. Music is highly effective. Rhythms are extremely effective. Yeah. They also 